you're on. Yeah, and so we can have welcome everyone to our uh, tea on Tuesdays at two. Um, once I get redirected here and see that we are uh, definitely out on the Zoom internet, which we are, uh, sorry, on our YouTube, uh, we will uh, continue with today's topic, which is um, a Jewish view of life after death, what happens uh, after we die. Uh, we're going to take a look at um, scriptural sources, Torah sources, Talmudic sources, uh, and have a chance to delve a little more deeply into this. Um, and uh, we begin first with a little bit of, of humor. Uh, you know, whenever we talk about death, it's always good, I guess, to bring in a little humor. So here uh, in John McPherson's Close to Home strip uh, from uh, many, many years ago, uh, a group of people lined up waiting to get into uh, the pearly gates there, waiting to get in heaven. And the um, a person at the desk says, attention, folks. There is a blue Chevy Cavalier in the parking lot of the Claremont Hospital with its lights on. Not that you can do anything about it now. <laughs> um, from uh, Mother Goose and Grimm, Mike Peters from Dayton, Ohio, uh, the place where I grew up, uh, comes this little bit. Uh, two folks walking around with robes and wings and halos, obviously in heaven. The man says, I didn't get a wink of sleep. My descendants were holding seances all night. I uh -huh. <laughs> uh, hear uh, from uh, Bizarro, uh, you know, when to worry about a permanent record. <laughs> oh boy, yeah. Um, and lastly, uh, also uh, from uh, Bizarro, uh, there's a grave with a ladder coming out of it. The headstone reads, hey, you never know. Uh, and apparently his widow is saying, he always insisted on having a backup system for everything. <laughs> That'll do it. All right, a little bit of prologue. Uh, some of the verses that we will see Hello. and have a chance to explore in a bit uh, are as follows. From Kohelet, from the book of Ecclesiastes. Uh, for everything, there is a season, a time for every experience under heaven a time to be born and a time to die. Uh, the blessing that we say once the Torah has been read, the blessing that we recite, Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher natam lanu Torah temet v'chayim olam natam betofeinu Baruch atah Adonai na Torah. We all say amen to that blessing. And that blessing in English is, blessed are you, eternal God, sovereign of the universe, who has given us a Torah of truth, and who has implanted immortal life within us. Uh, and we all say amen to that. In the Passover Haggadah, as we are singing about the little goat kid, uh, along comes the verse, then came the Holy One, blessed be God, who slew the angel of death. We'll get back to that in a moment. And from the traditional morning liturgy, <laughs> Baruch Ata Adonai Mechaye Meitim is recited. Uh, Blessed are you, God, who gives life to the dead. So this is some of our prologue uh, as we have a chance to get in to, uh, to, to the ideas about uh, death and the life after death. This is sort of going to piggyback, I guess, after our, over our discussion of uh, Jewish bioethics some time ago. Act 1, in the beginning there was death. In Genesis chapter one, God looks at everything that has been made, vayar Elohim et kol asher asa, everything that has been made, and God saw it, hine tov ma'od, it was very good. All the other days of creation, it just says it was good. On the sixth day of creation, it says it was very good. Well, why is on the sixth day of creation, why is it very good? Well, Rabbi Meir teaches uh, in the Midrash that it says very good, where elsewhere, of course, it says it was just good. The difference now is because with the creation of the animals and more importantly with human beings who are mortal, we learn that death is good. <laughs> and that's why it says very good. Okay. Uh, indeed, uh, as Adam and Eve are kicked out of the garden, uh, we learn that uh, we are made from dust and that we will return to dust. 
Uh, and just prior to that, the reason we are kicked out of the garden uh, is because God says now that human being has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. What if humans should re reach out and eat from the tree of life and live forever? Yeah. And so the eternal God banished human from the Garden of Eden. We were always meant to be mortal. We were, it was never in the creator's thought, uh, according to this verse, that human beings should be immortal. Uh, and indeed, you know, death can be a great motivator we have a finite time on this planet in which to accomplish some good. And that should be a motivating factor. That should be a, a source of inspiration for us. Everybody in our Torah dies. Sarah dies and is buried in Kiryat Arba, now Hebron, uh, and Abraham mourns her. Abraham dies uh, and is buried and is gathered to his people. These are some of the phrases we find within scripture. And when Jacob finished speaking his instructions to his sons, Jacob drew his feet into his bed and breathing his last, he was gathered to his people. So everybody, Moses, dies at the age of 120. And we are reminded in the book of Deuteronomy that life and death have been set before us. Uh, and we are commanded to choose life. So human beings are supposed to be mortal, that death is part of the fabric of life, that if there is birth on one end, uh, then there is death at the other end. Or as, um, as one of our rabbis wrote, you know, birth is a beginning uh, and death a destination, uh, but life is a journey. Uh, life is what takes place in between. I want to add just a little bit of a teaching to some of the Jewish concepts uh, built into the idea of our death. Um, so we read in Genesis that, you know, God breathes into this human form uh, that uh, in Genesis chapter two, human beings are made from the, you know, from the dust of the earth. <clears throat> um, God gathers, you know, yellow dirt and red dirt and brown dirt and black dirt and uh, white sand and mixes all of this together to create the first human being uh, and breathes into this human form uh, the breath of life. And that is when we become a, a living soul. This is when uh, human beings uh, now become conscious and cognizant. Um, and our tradition teaches us that just as God breathes into our nostrils the breath of life, creating us as a living soul. At the time of our death, God kisses us tenderly, and, and so to speak, inhales, breathing our soul out of us. So at the beginning of our life, there's a breath from God going into us, and at the end of our life, there is a gentle kiss, and God inhales instead of exhaling and breathes our soul out of us. So I want to, you know, we, we have um, such, you know, a, a, a tainted image of death thanks to television and movies, and sometimes even our own practical experiences where we have, you know, been part of a loved one's very painful and long and drawn out dying process. Uh, a lot of that is because of the medications and our medical technologies that we are able to do. Um, you know, certainly in the days of our ancestors, that technology was missing uh, and, and death came perhaps more rapidly, um, perhaps more unexpectedly, uh, or perhaps uh, people, people knew. Uh, I still think that people know that it is their time, um, such was my father-in-law who knew, uh, you know, after suffering from a variety of medical ailments, but, you know, pancreatic cancer there in the end, he knew that it was his time. And, um, and, and he, he just knew. So what happens after we die? Act two. Um, again, we're going to be relying on scriptural verses uh, and we, through the process of either analogies or uh, rabbinic commentary or just exploring the verses ourselves, uh, are going to see that there are uh, sometimes uh, allusions to and sometimes specific references to. So let's take a look. 
we begin in Genesis. Uh, Jacob now sees that his sons have returned. Uh, they have brought back a bloodied coat, uh, the coat of many colors that belonged to his son Joseph. Uh, Jacob uh, jumps to the conclusion that Joseph has been devoured by a wild beast. Uh, Joseph's brothers never say anything uh, to their father about what happened. They just present the coat uh, that has been torn and has blood on it. You know, is this by chance, you know, your son's coat? Uh, and the answer is, oh my God, Jacob says, yes, it is. Uh, my son has been devoured by a wild beast. Jacob draws the misconclusions. His sons don't correct him. At any rate, uh, Jacob tears his garments. This is part and parcel with our mourning practices. Tears his, uh, tears, uh, his garment and mourns Joseph for many days. Uh, and as uh, his sons and daughters, here we learn he has more than one daughter, more than Dina. We don't know the names of the others, but in this verse in Genesis, we have daughters. Rise up to comfort him, uh, but he refuses to be comforted. And he says, no, no, I will go to my son's grave. I will even go down to Sha'ol. And Jacob weeps for Joseph. Rabbi? Yep. Is that why at the funeral you put the ribbon and then tear it? Tear mm -hmm. the ribbon, right. Nowadays, uh, we tear the ribbon. Moses Maimonides taught us that to, uh, to purposefully destroy something that is useful um, is, a, um, is a waste and a violation of a Torah principle. Uh, and so uh, instead of tearing uh, you know, your jacket, uh, or a blouse or something that could be worn or given to someone else at a later date, um, we use a ribbon and we tear the ribbon. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, but the Orthodox still do tear their um, yeah. jackets yeah. or their clothes. They do, yeah. Uh -huh. Or they'll, they'll tear a tie or they'll, yeah, yeah, some still do. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, Reformed Judaism uh, chose to emphasize this teaching from Maimonides uh, more so than tearing a garment uh, and opts for a ribbon, which is pinned to the garment. Uh, Conservative also does the ribbon. Yep, yep. Many Jews use, use a ribbon. Uh, and so, you know, here, uh, indeed, most of our morning rituals trace back to verses in scripture. All right. Um, Hezekiah has a poem that is used by Isaiah where, again, this place of Sha'ol is, 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 is mentioned, uh, where it seems to be some place uh, where, you know, the dead seem to go. Uh, you know, Jacob wants to go down to Sha'ol, uh, to mourn his son. Um, this poem of Hezekiah, the king of Judah, talks about, you know, uh, thinking that his life was going to end in the, middle of his, in the middle of his life and that he would be consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of his years. Um, Job even mentions this place called Sheol. Uh, you know, as Job mourns the loss of his family, uh, you know, where, where is my hope? Who can see hope for me? Will, will this hope descend down to Sheol? Uh, will we go down together to the dust? Um, in Psalms, Sheol is mentioned, this place. Um, and it is mentioned as a place where God's presence can still be felt. If I ascend to the heavens, you know, you, God, are there, writes the psalmist. If I descend to this Sheol, uh, this nether world, this other place, if I descend and it's going down, uh, behold, you are there as well. So Sheol is uh, as a place from here. We get the idea it is down. Uh, Jacob mentions it is down too. Um, the psalmist even goes even further to say that, you know, you will not abandon me to Sheol or, or let your faithful one see this pit. Uh, you will teach me the path of life. Um, Jonah refers again to this pit, thinking that he is going to die, uh, to referring to this uh, place of Sheol. Um, and again, you know, uh, sheep-like, we head for Sheol with death as their shepherd. Um, and so 
we get an idea in scripture that there, there is a place where the dead go, Sha'ol. Sometime after we have died, some part of us is going to Sha'ol, uh, and death is the shepherd. Uh, but God will redeem my life from the clutches of Sha'ol. Uh, and so bear that thought in mind. Um, you know, even if you bring me down to Sha'ol, God, I will praise you. Um, and we have one specific reference, not so much to Sha'ol, but to someone who's being conjured back to the world of the living. Um, uh, this is King Saul. He's battling the Philistines. He's losing the battle uh, against the Philistines, and he doesn't understand why. God is supposed to be on my side. Why am I losing this battle? Uh, he wants to speak with the prophet uh, Samuel, but Samuel is dead. And supposedly all of the witches and those who divine by spirits have been kicked out of the land of Israel. Well, his servants say to him, you know, there's this woman who divines by ghost at Ain Dor, um, which interestingly enough, Ain Dor, these are all plays on word. The Hebrew word Ain Dor means, you know, source of generations, uh, you know, almost like a, a gateway to eternity uh, is the name of this place. Anyway, Saul goes there and says to this woman, uh, you know, bring me up whoever I shall name to you. And the woman says, who would you like me to conjure up for you? And he says, bring me up Samuel. And so she does. There's a little dispute there. I'm afraid to do this. You know, you're, you're going to kill me. No, I'm not going to kill you. I need to find out what's going on. All right. So she does so. And King Saul says, well, what is, tell me what you see. And she says, I see a godlike being coming up out of the earth. And he says to her, well, what form is he? And she says, it's an old man and he's covered with a robe. Saul perceives that this is Samuel, bows his face to the ground, uh, prostrates himself. And Samuel, the prophet, the dead prophet, Samuel's spirit, his soul, whatever, that's come up from the ground, says to Saul, why have you bothered me? You know, why have you disquieted me, bringing me up? And so based on these stories and, you know, this story and the references to Sha'ol, we get an idea from these that Sha'ol is a place where, you know, the soul goes or, or consciousness goes or some part of us goes and it does not want to be disturbed. We're there. Thank you very much. Leave me alone. Um, it is, if you remember Fiddler on the Roof, <laughs> the movie. Yeah, from a Sarah. <laughs> right, from a Sarah. Tevia's nightmare that he tells Golda in order to convince her that, you know, we, that her, the daughter is supposed to marry Mottel, uh, not the butcher. Uh, he conjures up this dream. Since this is being streamed to YouTube, we don't have uh, rights to show this snippet. Uh, and YouTube will shut down uh, the, you know, will we'll take off our, our lesson. And I don't want to go through all the problems of uh, editing out the clip. But you can Google uh, Tevia's dream. Uh, on YouTube, and you can see this. If you remember, you know, they're sitting in bed and Tevia tells, you know, Golda, don't be frightened, uh, and tells the story, you know, I had a dream, there was this, uh, we, we were all there, your, all of your relatives, all of our relatives were there. So, uh, and, and this is built on some of the much later Jewish idea about what might take place, uh, kind of like the play Our Town, uh, our souls, our consciousness um, is, is resting in Sha'ol. Here in Tevye's dream, it was, you know, at the grave. And our consciousness is there. We're aware of what's going on in the world, uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's kind of second, you know, nature. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, this is what, this is what the living are up to. Um, we dead don't want to be bothered with the problems uh, of, of the living, always happy to share in the joy. Uh, and so from a Sarah, you know, all the relatives are all there. Uh, and so this is built on what becomes this later idea that there is some place where 
some part of us is going for a period of time before something else happens or maybe nothing else happens. Mm. Act three, the death of death. Um, we begin with our creation again, uh, as understood by scripture. This is um, from Genesis chapter two. Uh, Adonai formed the earthling of the dust of the ground. Vayitzer Adonai et ha'adam. So looking at the English, you would say, well, Rabbi, you know, you, you, you didn't do spell check. You, you misspelled a word there. Does everybody see the word that's misspelled? Yeah, double F. Mm -hmm. The word mm -hmm. formed is written with two Fs. Well, the very he first word in the people. Hebrew, the very, I'm sorry? I said he formed two people. <laughs> yeah, nope. Uh, good guess though, Ellie. Um, uh, there, the, the first word in the Hebrew, vayitzer, has an extra yud, which to oh. the native Hebrew reader is just like the double F in our word formed, which is why I wrote it that way. Um, and so our rabbis, you know, could have said, oh, a scribal error, you know, this was a mistake. Uh, but of course they don't. Uh, they, they would never suggest that. Instead, that double yud is there for a lesson. And what that double yud is teaching us is that there were two formations taking place with this creation of this singular human being. What are those formations? One partaking of the nature of the celestial beings and the other partaking of the earthly creatures. Rabbi Tiftai says in the name of Rav Acha, this is in our Talmud recorded for us in our Midrash. God reasoned, if I create humans of the celestial elements, in other words, if we were to be created like the angels, then we would live and not die. While if I, God, create human beings of the terrestrial elements, they will die never being aware of life. Mm -hmm. That human beings um, need to be aware of both. We need to be aware of our mortality our conscious, we, we need to be consciously aware of our existence. And at that time, it was unclear whether or not animals did have that. Uh, there's been a lot of science and research that indicates that animals might actually know a lot more about life and death than, than we originally thought. But at any rate, let's take this, you know, from the teachings uh, just about 2000 years ago, that human beings, because we are, we represent something unique in this creation. Uh, we are going to be a mixture of these elements. We are going to have divinity, consciousness, um, uh, cognizance, uh, and at this end, we're going to be made out of the earthly materials. Rabbi Tiftai continued, therefore, God says, I will create humans of the upper, the heavenly elements, and the lower, the terrestrial, the earthly elements. When they live, they will die. Again, we are created mortal. And when they die, they will live. Wow. Um, wait, there's more. <laughs> um, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, the verse says, see, I am God, I am the one, there's no God beside me. I deal death and I give life. Amit uh, and I heal. None can deliver from my hand. Our rabbi say, wait a minute, that's the wrong order. It shouldn't be I deal death and give life. It should be I give life and deal death. It should be reversed. Why is it dealing death first and then giving life? Because, teach our rabbis, and remember the rabbis are the Pharisees, uh, descendants of the Pharisees. And remember from our last session, it is the Pharisees who believe in life after death. The Sadducees, not so much. Um, the rabbis uh, here understanding this verse say, because this is alluding to life after death. I deal death and I give life to those who are dead. This is the argument of the rabbis. Uh, and again, in 1 Samuel, we have the same thing, that same order. God deals death and gives life. I cast down to Sha'ol and raises up from Sha'ol. So by the time we get to this prophet Samuel, who again, Saul is going to conjure up after he's dead, uh, the prophet Samuel is teaching us that there is in this verse references to life after death. 
God cast down to Sheol, this place where the souls go, uh, again, um, kind of like a waiting room, perhaps. Um, and God raises up from Sheol, a life after death. Uh, Ecclesiastes, once again, from Kohelet. Um, the dust returns to the ground as it was, the spirit, Ruach, returns to God who gave it. And is so the rabbi, rabbi, is yeah. that where they get uh, Jesus coming back up? Um, After he's dead and on the cross and he comes uh, back? Well, no, that's, sort of, no uh, th that's a little bit different. We'll, 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 okay. get in, we'll, we'll, we'll stick with the Jewish, uh, the Jewish approach here. Okay. Um, <laughs> but certainly the idea of immortality uh, is something that Christianity does take right out of Judaism. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll talk about we, why we stopped talking about it. But first, I want to lay the foundation for uh, where our sense of this immortality and what it means comes from. Uh, Rabbi Meir is now trying to, again, uh, look concretely at the Torah text, because again, these verses, you know, this deals death and gives life. Well, look, maybe that was done for poetic reasons. Okay. Uh, you know, the Sadducees would have ordered, yeah, it says that, but look, that's just, that's just poetry. You know, uh, you rabbis know that, you know, the, the chronological, chronological order of things uh, doesn't exist when it comes to Torah. And therefore, this is just poetic. Uh, and so Rabbi Meir is going to take it. All right, let me try a different track. Let me try a different tack. Um, once that we know that there is life after death from the verse, then will Moses and the children of Israel sing this song to God. Uh, this is the song at the sea. This is the song that contains Micha Mocha. Uh, and Rabbi Meir is saying, look, it says the children of Israel will sing. This is future. And since it's written as future tense, this is a song that we, Israelites, will be singing to God in the time to come, in the world to come. We will sing this to God. All right. Some went with that. Some did. You know, the great thing about Judaism, hey, you know, Judaism teaches X, but Jews believe Y, Z, A, B, Q, you know, whatever it is. Um, Isaiah also alludes to this. God will destroy death forever in the future messianic time. God will wipe away our tears and put an end to, you know, the reproach uh, of our people. Uh, God will destroy death. Um, in 2 Kings, we have this really bizarre story. Um, and again, uh, whether we take this literally, whether we take this figuratively, whether we take this as analogy or as myth, these are all part of the spectrums of Judaism, but we have this in our scripture. Uh, there were a group of Israelites who were burying a man. Uh, they spied a group of Moabites coming, uh, probably to attack them. Uh, and so as they were digging the grave, for whatever reason, Elisha, who is the prophet who uh, takes over from Elijah, uh, Elisha is now dead uh, and is buried. Uh, his bones are there. And remember, we talked about, you know, the ancient burial practice of sort of leaving the, the body laid there for a period of time uh, in some family niche, uh, which was then perhaps later the bones were collected and, and interred. Um, at any rate, they dump the body, uh, fearing their lives to flee from the Moabites. Uh, he ends up touching Elisha's bones, and the man is revived and stands on his feet. That's okay. Mm -hmm. um, it's important for us to look outside of our sources. Uh, as you know, I like to do, we brought in Josephus uh, and other writings when we looked at the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees. Well, Tacitus who is, you know, the historian. Uh, this is from um, my materials on anti-Semitism. Uh, Tacitus uh, did not have nice things to say about Jews. Uh, he compared us to, you know, inept of barbarians. Our houses of worship were, uh, you know, houses of prostitution. Uh, he did not have nice things to say about Jews. But in the same sentence where we are, you know, lowly and despicable is this. Jews consider it a crime to kill a single child. I'm not quite sure why that's a bad thing. You know, that seems to be a good thing. But 
In 50 CE, even Tacitus is aware that Judaism teaches there is immortal life, um, not just for those who die in battle, but for Tacitus, that was, the, uh, that was the focus because we Jews were rebelling against Roman persecution. We didn't like Rome. We didn't like the Roman Empire in our land. We wanted to kick them out. So there were lots of struggles between uh, the Jews of that day and the Roman Empire. So for Tacitus, you know, obviously um, his encounter with Jews was a little more confrontational, uh, at least confrontational of the Jews against Rome. And so therefore for Tacitus, you know, we consider it, uh, you know, immortal life for those who die in battle whence their disdain for death. So even Tacitus recognizes that uh, Judaism is teaching there is life after death. Um, and then Ezekiel has this vision of the dry bones. Uh, damn bones, damn bones, damn dry bones. Um, which might be a dual metaphor here. Um, Isaiah is led to this valley of dry bones. Uh, and God asks, I'm sorry, Ezekiel, is led to this valley of dry bones. Ezekiel, will these bones live? Um, and Ezekiel answers appropriately and says, only you know for sure, God. Um, and he, uh, God says, watch and behold. And here these dry bones assembled themselves and, you know, bits and pieces of them were put together and sinew and muscle and flesh and organs. All of these things came back to these dry bones. Uh, prophesy, says God, and say to them, I'm going to open your graves and lift you up out of the graves, O my people, and bring you to the land of Israel. Now, Ezekiel is part of the Babylonian exile group. The first time in over 500 years that Jews are not living, that these Israelites are not in the land of Israel or Judea. Uh, we are not in Jerusalem. Well, there's a, a number of us who are left behind, obviously. But um, the rich and the upper class and the priestly class were all dragged back to Babylonia. Um, uh, we have a psalm, by the rivers of Babylon, we laid down and wept. This was such a traumatic event. Um, because at that time, the belief of God was that God lived okay? in the temple in Jerusalem. Okay. And if we are not there in Jerusalem at the temple, God is not with us and we are lost. Um, and so Ezekiel's vision here of these dry bones might be one, oh, Judeans, you feel yourselves uh, as if you are in your grave here in Babylonia, that you will die here, but you will not die here. God will bring us back to the land of Israel. Uh, and sure enough, the Babylonians are conquered by the Persians. King Cyrus says to the Judeans, hey, if you all would like to go back and rebuild your temple, go ahead. Uh, and we do get restored back to Israel. Or later generations take this to mean that there is going to be a physical resurrection from our grave. They take uh, Ezekiel's vision literally, not necessarily in context with the historical setting, but see it as a, as, as a prophecy about future times. Okay, perhaps. Uh, even Rabbi Chia, and the Talmud says that a time will come when here the just, the righteous, will break through the soil, rise up in Jerusalem, um, and there will be a physical resurrection. Our bodies will be resurrected. This is the belief in Judaism that means that, you know, every part of your body needs to go into the grave with you. Otherwise, when this physical resurrection takes place and, you know, your leg was amputated because it was gangrenous uh, and you don't have that leg, well, guess what? In the world to come for all of eternity, you're only going to have one leg. So we got to make sure we get the leg to where your body is going to be buried. Either we save the leg or we bury the leg in your grave where you will later be buried. <laughs> um, but... Sadia Gaon raises the great question. Sadia Gaon, you know, 10th century, 9th, 10th century uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Poland, raises this question. Suppose a lion were to eat a man, and then the lion would drown, and a fish would eat the lion, and then the fish would be caught by a man who would eat the fish, and then that man, in a horrible accident, 
would also be burned, you know, his house catches fire, he burns and is turned to ashes. Whence would the creator restore the first man, the one who was eaten by the lion? Would he do it from the lion, from the fish, from the second man, or from the fire, or from the ashes? Um, Sadia's implication is one of two things. A, the creator of the world can do whatever the creator of the universe needs to do and will reassemble those molecules. Or maybe Sadia Gon is raising the question that maybe physical resurrection isn't it. Rabbi? Yep. Is this the, the part where uh, the very religious Jewish people do not believe in organ, organ donations? Is that where they get this? This is, this is part of that. Um, more so is the, you know, uh, desecration of a, of a cadaver. Um, um, and and uh, is, is a little more prominent in that discussion about, you know, not organ doning. Um, but even um, most of the Orthodox movement uh, sees the value of organ doning. Uh, and perhaps with Sadia's teaching here, uh, understands that, yeah, you know, if I donate my kidney, my liver, my lungs, my heart, whatever, if I need that in the world to come, God will get me that. Um, organ donation is not universally accepted throughout all of Judaism. Uh, some of the very far right uh, spectrum of the uh, Orthodox spectrum may still say that it is inappropriate or even unhalachic. Um, but mainstream Judaism, you know, 95 percent of Judaism recognizes that it is halachically valid. It is a halachically valid choice. But yes, that is part of it. All right. Um, our, our rabbis of our Talmud. Uh, so what, what we're seeing is a bit of an evolution. Scripture seems to indicate there's a place where the soul is going to go or consciousness is going to go, or something's going to happen after we die. Scripture is not clear. It doesn't spell it out point blank in very plain, simple language. But because it leaves it vague and has these references, it is our later rabbis who begin to uh, uh, extend those, um, those teachings and build on those teachings to Ooh, create rabbi. an understanding of what might take place. Life after um, by the time we get to the rabbis of the Talmud, this now has become a firm Jewish concept that um, not only uh, Jews, but, uh, you know, later on, all human beings. But in the beginning, it was just Jews. You know, there has to be some benefit to being Jewish. Uh, the rabbis of the Talmud. In the world to come, there's no eating, no drinking, no washing, no anointing, no sexual intercourse. Sounds pretty boring. But the righteous sit with their crowns on their heads and enjoying the radiance of the divine presence. <laughs> so even the rabbis of the Talmud are acknowledging that, you know, that the world to come, Olam Haba, this, uh, you know, pardes, paradise, this heavenly future, um, cannot be a physical existence. If it is, then that, that's, that's not, you know, that's not perfection. It needs to be a perfect existence. Uh, or at least this is how this teaching is going to be interpreted by none other than Rambam. Enjoying the radiance of the divine presence. Rambam says this means the souls, souls, not bodies, souls, will blissfully enjoy the delight in their attainment of knowledge of the truly uh, essential nature of God, the creator, a delight which is like that experienced by the holy angels who know God's existence firsthand. So we... Uh, you know, in, in some fashion, our consciousness is going to merge with God's mind in some fashion. Um, and that the resurrection of the dead, and here Rambam is not necessarily referring to a physical resurrection, but life after death, is one of our most cardinal principles established by Moses, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses of the Torah. A person who does not believe this principle has no real religion, certainly not Judaism. By the time we get to Rambam, our understanding of this olam haba, this world to come, uh, this next life, has, has grown tremendously from the vague teachings of our Talmud uh, and the even vaguer references in scripture into a well-established okay. belief. Right. Um, and in the Haggadah, 
when we sing about that little goat kid, the last verse is, and then came the Holy One, blessed be God, the angel. who killed the angel of death, that killed the butcher that, you know, the, the song goes on. Well, that's because Passover is understood by our rabbis as, a, as the heralding of the Messianic age. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when the Messianic age comes, when the Messiah comes, this physical world as we know it ceases to exist and death is overthrown. God kills the angel of death. There is no more death. That's what the song ultimately leads to. It starts off with a goat kid and it's not a goat kid. The goat kid is Israel and the two coins, the two Zuzim are the Ten Commandments and it ends with you know terrible things happening to this goat and terrible things happening to all the things that did terrible things to the goat and in the end what happens the world ends and the angel of death is dead i want to return for a moment just quickly to summarize a situation we had in our jewish you know our bioethics look and that was about rabbi mm -hmm. hanania ben tradion who was teaching torah the Romans wanted to execute him by uh, burning him at the stake. They have wool, wet wool uh, stuck all around him. They have the parchment from the Torahs all around him, uh, which is slow burning so that he would die slowly. Again, Romans uh, excelled at the way to torture people to death. Um, Rabbi Hanania is not going to kill himself faster, but the executioner says, look, if I remove all this stuff and cause you to die more quickly, his question is, will I get into the world to come? This is a Roman, a Roman executioner. And he wants to know from the rabbi, okay, will I, if I do this, will I get into the world to come? Will I have eternal life? And the rabbi says, yes. So the, uh, the impediments to the fire are removed. The rabbi dies very quickly. Then the executioner leaps in and jumps into the fire and dies. And God proclaims, bat kol is the uh, rabbinic term for heavenly voice. This is God speaking. And God says, Rabbi Hananiah and the executioner have entered olam haba, world to come, the life to come. And so from those teachings within the Talmud, Judaism evolves its understanding, whereas originally life after death may have only been for the Judeans, for the Israelites. Uh, and indeed in the Talmud, it talks about people who deny God's existence and people who deny there is life after death do not get, you know, do not merit life in, in the world to come. That has evolved to the point where Judaism understands that all human beings, all human beings, um, uh, have a part in the world to come. Um, Rabbi Hillel and Rabbi Shammai are here, their schools, you know, the, the, the schools of thoughts uh, of these two competing rabbis uh, teach that on the day of judgment, and there's going to be a day of judgment, whether that day of judgment is Yom Kippur, whether that day of judgment is Rosh Hashanah, whether the day of judgment is the day of our death, or whether that day of judgment is when the Messiah comes, there's going to be a day of judgment. And there are basically three groups of people. The first group of people, the righteous ones, the tzaddikim, they're going to be inscribed for, you know, everlasting life. Life in olam haba, the world to come. The second group will be doom, doomed to gehinom. We'll talk about gehinom. And the third will go down to gehinom, will scream, and will rise up to olam haba. Mm -hmm. So what is this all about? Well, this is about accountability. Uh, Judaism teaches us that we will each be held accountable for what we did and did not do in God's world with the life that we have. And that accountability for some will be painful and short, this third group, those of us who, you know, have some unresolved mistakes. Um, some unresolved transgressions. We will go down to Gehinom, we will confront those mistakes in some fashion, and we will rise to Olam Haba. The second group, the holy evil, they're going down to Gehinom. Well, what's happening there? Well, we don't know for sure. So we have the following teachings. 
uh, for the rabbis of the Talmud, this period of accountability was a, um, a, a courtroom scene. And everybody we had wronged, every uh, deed that we did that was wrong, that will, uh, they will be there and they will take the witness chair and they will testify against us. You know, this is what you did to me. This is how it made me feel. They get to tell their whole story. Um, for some people, this is going to be, you know, uncomfortable, painful, but, but finite for the most part. Um, for others who are, you know, just wholly evil and committed such heinous crimes, for those people, those stories might go on for what seems to be forever. Uh, how long does that take? Who knows? Um, you know, this is, this is beyond our mortal existence. This is beyond our material minds to fully, gra to fully um, uh, fathom and grasp. Another teaching uh, that I've heard that, you know, again, given modernity and the twilight zone uh, is, is one that I actually do kind of favor. Um, and that is not in a reincarnation sense, but in this metaphysical, spiritual existence, the wrongs that I committed to against another are going to be relived. Again, not as a reincarnation, but my consciousness is going to merge, you know, in a time travel kind of thing uh, with the consciousness of the person that I have wronged. I will be fully aware that my conscious is my conscious, but I am going to see and feel what I did to this other person. Um, in, in a Vulcan mind melding sort of fashion, um, you know, I'm going to become part of this person for this experience. The reasoning behind this is that the world to come is supposed to be a perfect existence. Well, how can my soul or my consciousness get into this place if there are memories of bad deeds done to me and forgotten bad deeds that I've done to others? There's got to be a way to, to balance that out. There's a plus and there's a minus. You know, I think I got away with something. The plus, the minus, the pain of the individual. There has to be a way to bring those two things together to neutralize that. That, that memory has to be closed off in order for there to be a perfect existence in the world to come. So how does that happen? For the rabbis, it was this trial. The mere fact that you have to sit and listen to the people you hurt to tell you their whole life story and how what you did to them so damaged them or hurt them or denied them whatever it was, that experience is going to negate the plus that you think you got away with and is going to be healing and provide closure for the person who was wrong. In this metaphysical twilight zone time travel mind melding experience, you're going to feel it. You know, it's not just a matter of this person telling you their story. You are going to relive that moment as them. Fully conscious, conscious that they are they and that you are you, but you're going to relive this moment. Uh, and at any point in their life that that moment comes back to them to traumatize them, you're going to relive that. Um, you know, hell, Judaism does not have a concept of hell. Hell Hell is about revenge, you know, and Judaism teaches us that God is about justice. Tzedek, tzedek, tir dof. You know, I want Hitler, uh, Eichmann, and, and all the henchmen, uh, you know, spousal abusers, pedophiles. I want them all to rot, rapists, murderers. I want them all to rot in Dante's seventh level of hell. But, but that's revenge. There's, that's not about justice. Um, in both of these scenarios, we're getting a little bit closer to justice. If Hitler is going to be gassed and shot and bombed and starved and experimented on, you know, uh, six million plus times, 
oh, yeah, okay. I, I think I can live with that. Yeah. Um, uh, if the people who have caused tremendous harm and hurt are going to feel that. And this is what Judaism emphasizes about the world to come, is that this is where justice takes place. Justice is not available to us in this world. Justice will take place in the world to come. And so there is this period of accountability that takes place before we get into Olam Haba, the world to come. One quick look, uh, and then we'll open it up for questions uh, and comments. Um, what does Reformed Judaism say? Well, our ideas about life after death in the world to come has evolved. In 1885, our first official platform of Reform rabbis basically said, look, we accept that the soul is immortal, but we reject the idea of Gehenna, Gehinom, uh, paradise, the world to come, Eden, uh, as abodes of everlasting punishment and reward. We reject those as not being rooted in Judaism. Excuse me. Well, that may have been a little premature. Because when we get to the Columbus platform of 1937, we affirm that human beings, I apologize, this was the language of 1937, Human beings are created in the divine image. Our spirit is, an immort uh, is immortal. Uh, as a child of God, humans are endowed with moral freedom and are charged with the responsibility of overcoming evil and striving for other ideal ends. So again, our spirit is immortal, but that was about all we really wanted to say. In San Francisco, in the San Francisco platform of 1976, we made this great statement. Amid the mystery we call life, we affirm that human beings created in God's image share in God's eternality, despite the mystery we call death. When we get to San Francisco, we've now reconnected with a lot of Jewish teachings about you know, life after death. And, and we're not so bold in a chutzpah as to say uh, this is no longer possible. We're leaving it up to this mystery. Um, and then lastly, our reform principles passed again in Pittsburgh in 1999. We trust in our traditions promise that though God created us as a finite beings, the spirit within us is eternal. So there you have a chance to see um, some of the uh, platform teachings uh, <clears throat> uh, of reform Judaism. Uh, with regards to uh, with regards to our understanding of, of life after death, Whew. so I know that's a whole lot. We'll take a little extra time. Usually we try to end at three, but we're going to go for obviously a little bit longer. Basically, what I was trying to show us is how references in Scripture that indicate something's up after we die. Something happens. This place called Sheol. Uh, the conjuring up of Samuel, um, the references to that place as being associated with some place after death. Um, from that beginning, you get further elucidating teachings, further teachings by our rabbis uh, giving rise to a, a more full-blown, a more full-blown concept of a life after death. Uh, the soul, our consciousness, maybe even our bodies, um, which then become part and parcel with Jewish belief. This was indeed what we were thumping out on the streets uh, of the Middle East in, in Rome, in Athens, to the Greek Empire, to the Roman Empire. And Judaism was winning large amounts of converts. We were a very popular religion because the only people in those days who had life after death were the kings and the pharaohs. So now Judaism is teaching, you know, Jews have immortal life. Uh, come and join, be a Jew and have immortal life. That evolves to today's Jewish belief in that all human beings have, you know, uh, already have uh, immortal life. And we did that to take care of that. You know, if you know dessert is coming after every meal, you stop asking about dessert because our emphasis is not on doing what we do in this world because of that. That's already taken care of. We're all going there. There is no hell. We are going to be held accountable, 
which for some might very well be like hell, but you know, there is no hell. Um, and so now uh, we can focus on what we do between birth and death. That becomes our key focus. Um, but when Rome becomes Christian uh, in the you know, uh, middle of the uh, you know, fourth century, once the religion has an imperial force behind it, and here are these Jews um, uh, still around and still talking about life after death, uh, yeah, for Jews, yeah, well, guess what? Not for Jews, now it's for Christians and Christians only. Um, and the only way you get life after death is if you believe in Jesus. Um, and by the way, if you say anything offensive to Christianity, and especially during the um, European Christian um, uh, persecution against the Jews, you know, the mere presence of a Jew was offensive to Christianity. Uh, and so, you know, you hid yourself in ghettos. You were forced to live in ghettos. Uh, you tried to get through the day without getting beaten. Uh, and then uh, if you said anything that was offensive to Christianity, uh, well, you can get, you, we will kill you. And to say that Jews have immortal life too, that's offensive to Christianity. You die. Uh, to say that all human beings, oh, that's offensive to Christianity. You die. Uh, this was the Christian persecution at that time. This is not Christianity today. Uh, but, you know, in the medieval ages, this was commonplace. And so we stopped talking about it. We just stopped talking about it. It's still part of our teachings. It's still part of our prayers. But we're no longer talking about it. Why? Because if we mention it, uh, we're going to get killed. Well, let's stop talking about it. We know this. We, we don't need to convince anybody else. We're good. Uh, and so we stopped talking about it, which was sad and tragic because we've not had a chance to uh, explore this idea uh, until modern times. And then by the time we get to modern times, the belief is that Jews don't believe in life after death. Yeah. You know, we emphasize this life. That's why we say L'chaim. You know, it's about life, this life. Well, Judaism teaches there is life after death. Uh, Jews believe whatever they want to believe. But for 3,000 years at least, Judaism has been teaching there is life after death. There's a song, uh, again, I wish I could play the song, uh, but I'm not able to because we don't have copyrights to it. And because I am streaming this to uh, YouTube, it will be shut down. Um, it is, uh, the song is called Let the Mystery Be uh, by the 10,000 Maniacs by Natalie Merchant. You can, uh, you can, uh, you know, watch this. Um, and I'm, I'm going to read some of the words. It's called Let the Mystery Be. Oh, you know what? I can probably do a little bit better than that. Um, I could very easily... Uh, share the screen, uh, and we can have a chance uh, to see the lyrics. Uh, so here they are. Everybody's wondering what and where they all came from. Everybody's worrying about where they're going to go when the whole thing's done. Nobody knows for certain, and so it's all the same to me. I think I'll just let the mystery be. Some say once you're gone, you're gone forever. Some say you're going to come back. Some say you rest in the arms of the Savior if the sinful ways you lack. Some say that they're coming back in a garden, but your carrots, uh, but your carrots are in the sweet peas. <laughs> I think I'll just let the mystery be. Um, some say uh, they're going to a place called glory, and I ain't saying it ain't a fact. <laughs> but I've heard that I'm on the road to purgatory, and I don't like the sound of that. I believe in love and I live my life accordingly, but I choose to let the mystery be. I choose to let the mystery be. And that becomes the chorus. I cannot say to you, I believe with all of my heart that there is life after death. I choose to let the mystery be. I find it very comforting to know that there will be an accountability, uh, that those who think they have gotten away with it, have, have screwed us, has harmed another human being, that they're in for a big surprise. I like that. I find it comforting that my consciousness might in some future time merge with the consciousness of my great, 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 great grandparents, who I know nothing about, and hopefully my great, 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 great grandchildren. 
I cannot tell you that I believe that with all of my heart, but I do find that thought very comforting. And when I die, I'm not going to know one way or the other. Well, I will know one way or the other. If there's nothing, uh, doesn't matter. <laughs> I've lived my life uh, as best I can. Um, and I am prepared for, you know, those uh, encounters with my past mistakes. Um, and if not, well, I lived my life the way that I wanted to live it. So we will, um, I, will, uh, I will end here um, and see if there might be some opportunity for us to begin some questions and answers. Uh, if the question and answering uh, goes on too long, we may have to continue next week. But let me see uh, what our thoughts are at this point. Yes, Sylvia. I have a question I read in one of our prayer books, I don't know if the recent one or a past one, that the soul that God gave you was perfect and pure, yep. and you should live your life in such a way as you return it as unblemished as possible. So then uh -huh. the question is, are there an infinite mind, um, a number of souls? That's what the question I always had. If you're going to give it back, where does, it, does somebody else get it now? Uh, excellent question. Uh, excellent question. Um, uh, yes, the, the Spanish mystics had a thought that there was a finite number of souls created and that over time there would be a recycling. It's called Gugulea Nefeshot, the circle of souls, that another soul will come back. Uh, but this belongs to a particular um, Spanish mystical thought. Um, uh, I think mainstream Judaism has been more influenced by thinkers like Martin Buber, who teach us that every human being represents something new and unique in the world. Uh, and so there's enough souls to go around for all of humanity throughout all of time. Um, and uh, yes, we, um, uh, it is part of our morning uh, liturgy. Uh, both in the reform Sidur, reform prayer books, conservative, orthodox, clear across the movement that the soul that you have given me, O oh God, is pure. Uh, you know, and again, this is in reaction to Christianity, which is teaching the soul comes with original sin. Right. Um, Judaism teaches the soul comes pure and comes right from God. Um, the vessel from the soul for the soul can become uh, dirty through deed, but there are ways to repair that. There is teshuva to fix that. Uh, the soul itself is pure. Uh, and uh, maybe the soul is our consciousness. Um, in, in a very interesting book by, um, I'm blanking on the author's name, the book is called The Soul's Code. Uh, he uh, suggests that our personality, our personality is part of our soul. Um, and he spent a lot of time reflecting on the studies of identical twins you know, genetically identical, uh, and yet, you know, uh, raised in and, and raised in the same home, yet they have unique personalities. Why is that? So um, our personalities, and I would like to think our consciousness is part of our soul. Yes, other questions, uh, please. You may have to shout it out because we've got a lot of viewers and I'm not able to see everybody at the same time. And I see Marion. Yes, Marion, go right ahead. Okay, I have a thought and then a question. Uh, when you started, you were talking about, or you read that God, when somebody was dying, kissed the person. Well, I was thinking that a number of people, when they're in a coma, and right before, they don't say a word for quite a while weeks you know, and then right before they pass away they make a sound hmm. and that gave me an image of that's when god kissed the person that sudden gasp yeah could be uh, absolutely yeah absolutely. and then i had a question yep Judaism ever address you know when somebody passes away and this is so frequent other people will say, well, now that person will see so-and-so again who previously passed away. Mm -hmm. Does Judaism say anything about that? Um, specifically, um, perhaps not, um, but it is part of the idea. Uh, if there is an immortal part of us, 
And if that immortal part of us is, again, our personality, our consciousness, and if that immortal part of us is going into the next life, then, uh, like Tevia's dream, uh, we are going to be with our loved ones. And uh, again, I'm going to let the mystery be. Uh, I find that imagery very comforting. And it may be a little chutzpah dick of us as you know, science looks out in the universe and says, oh my God, look what we just discovered. It may be rather chutzpah dick of us to say that this physical existence is it. You know, there is nothing afterwards. Well, you know, no proof uh, one way or the other uh, does not negate the possibility. So when it comes to, you know, that's why I, uh, I like that song by the 10,000 Maniacs. I let the mystery be. We'll find out. And, and what difference does it make? The, the difference I think it makes is how I approach and how we approach death. If you believe that, you know, death is, is not the end, that there is something afterwards, that there's going to be a reconnection with my loved ones in Olam Haba in the world to come, then death is no longer quite as scary. Death is no longer... Uh, something to be feared, uh, you know, the end of my existence. No, it's the end of my physical existence, but it's the emergence into another. Um, and I have seen how, you know, as, as a hospice chaplain, uh, I saw how those Christian and Jews um, with whom I worked um, and families with whom I worked who had a belief in, uh, you know, life after death, how the death, sad and as tragic as it was, wasn't the end. There was, there was, there was a bud of hope, um, and it made it made that death less fearsome and and less tragic, as tragic as it was nonetheless. Whether the person was you know ninety years old or nineteen years old, uh, there was something there that provided them with comfort. Uh, Rabbi, can I would like to contribute yes, to something? Um, I know that you're aware of this, but I'm sure other people are not, but I had gone to a uh, psychic who connected you to past death uh, and um, to people who had passed on. And as I was talking to her about it, because people did come to me from past, you know, who had passed on, but what we had talked about was that what she had told me, you know, and of course nobody knows because we're still alive, but she had said to me that you will see that person in the life and at the age that you want to perceive them at. So again, she's kind of alluding to the fact that there's a life after death, but not necessarily that physical being which i thought was kind of interesting so um that just you know the concept that your soul is going to live on but not necessarily in that same physical shape but you know it may be perceived that way but i had another uh question for you when we're talking you were talking about accountability and i was thinking about yom kippur mm -hmm. and don't we at that time for those who take it seriously account for those things that we have done wrong to people and aren't we even commanded to talk to those people who we may have wronged and mm -hmm. correct those so that we're not carrying it on to us in another life. Yeah, uh, absolutely, Flo, uh, Flo, good point. And also just to the thing about resurrection, uh, I am uh, a non-believer in physical resurrection because I hope to live to be a very old man um, and when I die, that is not the body I want to be resurrected with. Okay. Uh, I would like my 21-year-old body back, please. That, that's the body I want to live in forever. Uh, I was in great shape, uh, you know, didn't have a uh, fat wrinkle, had a full head of curly hair. Um, you know, that's the body I want. So I am not one who ascribes to a physical resurrection. 
As for the power of Yom Kippur, yes. Herein lies the, the real power of Yom Kippur. If we take care of our wrongful deeds in this life, I go back to the person I've wronged. I'm so sorry. You know, I was a 16 year old schmuck. You know, what can you expect? You know, please forgive me. Um, uh, if I do that now, I don't have to do that after I die. And when I forgive people in this life of the wrongs that they have done to me, I spare them that ordeal after they die. So the more you deal with in this life, the less you have to deal with in the next life. That's why, you know, the school of Bilal and Shammai are teaching. There's those three groups. One group goes straight to Olam Haba, right into the world to come, uh, right into life eternal. Chaye Olam, it is called in the Talmud. Uh, why? Because they've dealt with all their wrongs. It's not saying that they were were, were perfect, were righteous, were excellent in their behavior. No, because even the righteous make mistakes. But they dealt with it in this life. And having dealt with it in this life, they go straight on it. Uh, the rest of us, the vast majority of us, we've got some unresolved stuff because we forgot about it, because we no longer you know, are in touch with the people who... And so on Yom Kippur, if I truly forgive those that have wronged me, dump the resentment, get rid of the anger, um, you know, remember the event, of course. How can you forget the event? Uh, but I now deny the event any control over me. Eh, it's done. I don't have to deal with that in the world to come uh, before I get into the world to come. And the others don't have to deal with it either. So yeah, that's the power of teshuva. Great. Other questions? I was just going to comment on my, my hospice experience where people are toward the end or at the end and their family has said that they, they see people, figures hovering just oh, yeah. beyond and they start talking to those who have gone on and mm -hmm. holding conversations with them. So yeah. makes you wonder. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I have heard that. Um, uh, more often than not. Again, I think it was my work as, you know, uh, as a chaplain, uh, and especially as a hospice chaplain, uh, that really opened my eyes to this mystery. Um, I had, I was with people, and they were clearly speaking to, and they mentioned names, mm -hmm. uh, and loved ones said, that's his mother. Uh, you know, now, there are those who would say, yes, it's all part of the psychology, you know, as the brain is being starved of oxygen and blah, and the chemical balances, blah, blah, blah. Could be. It could also be that they are seeing the souls of these people. Let the mystery be, you know. We, we modern human beings, we have to have an answer for everything. Uh, we have to have an answer that is... Uh, concrete and provable. Well, I'll rephrase that. Most of us moderns, <laughs> we want, you know, concrete answers, uh, you know, real proof. Um, others are happy to accept, you know, rumor as proof. Uh, most of us want real proof. Uh, well, we're never going to have real proof of this. Um, and so uh, let's just let the mystery be, perhaps. There's some real wisdom there. If it means that when I come to the end of my life, I have these hopes and expectations. Is that so bad if it turns out not to be true? No, because if it's not true, if, if, that, if, if, if death is really the end, then I'm not going to know it. But my attitudes towards my dying uh, and my attitudes toward my life become a little bit different. Uh, and I think that's the beauty. And for those who believe this firmly, uh, you know, uh, I, I have seen that in, in, in their behavior. Again, the difference is that Judaism is not about, you know, doing good in this world so that we can get into Olam Haba, into paradise, into heaven, because that's where we're going. And so therefore, I don't need to worry about that. That allows me to focus on the good I need to do in this world so that a period of accountability will be much shorter for me, that I don't have to deal with these stupid things. I will. I've got some stupid things that I'm going to have to deal with, um, and, and I'm ready to deal with them.
you know, uh, if, if that's the way it goes. Uh, great, you know, we'll, I'll deal with it. Uh, I will face those painful moments. Um, but um, I would hope that I'm, I'm becoming uh, more cognizant of the choices that I do have in my day uh, and that I am choosing a little more wisely so that I can avoid adding to that length of time <laughs> that I will have to spend in accountability. All right. Um, last, la last questions, thoughts? We'll switch to this view. Okay. Terrific. I thank you all for joining us for tea on Tuesday at two. Uh, next week, uh, I will announce the topic in advance. We've got some uh, other ideas that have been suggested to us, including a look at some of our uh, biblical judges, you know, the, the whole history of, uh, of, of, of the Bible, how we, how we get into the judges and how we get from judges into the kings. Uh, so we may be taking a look at that. Uh, we've got some other ideas uh, as well. So we will see what I'm able to put together for us next Tuesday. Oh, wait a minute. Next Tuesday. Oh, yes, next Tuesday is the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. We are going to go on a little mini sabbatical. Um, uh, we will not meet on the 24th of uh, November, which is next Tuesday. Uh, we will not meet then, uh, as uh, many of us will be busy preparing for Thanksgiving. Uh, we will meet uh, after that on December the 1st. Uh, when we're going to have a guest speaker on December the 1st, uh, Chief Barr, uh, Chief of Police uh, Aviv Barr from Whittier is going to be our guest speaker for Tea on Tuesdays at 2. Uh, we're going to learn about his journey to becoming Chief of Police of Whittier, his journey to becoming uh, uh, an American citizen, uh, his family uh, originally from Israel. So uh, Chief of Police uh, Aviv Barr, will be part of our next uh, Tea on Tuesday at 2 session, which will be December 1st. So I will wish you Shabbat Shalom coming up at the end of this week uh, and a very happy and healthy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. In sabbatical. You're welcome. Rabbi. Yes, we'll have a week sabbatical. See you happy all. Happy Thanksgiving. Rabbi, have a wonderful day.